Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Mike Latham, owner of the web's premier traditional knife store, CollectorKnives.net. Mike played a large role in the past decade in swinging the knife world's attention from tactical and pocket jewelry to a more traditional style of folding knife, the slip joint. And through collaborations with some of Italy's finest manufacturers, Mike also designs and brings to market some of the coolest and most robust traditionally styled modern slip joint folders around. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about that and a much anticipated new release. Uh, but first, a word to the wise, if you can't finish this episode in video form, remember to download it to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen on your way to work, dropping off the kids while you get groceries or while you mow the lawn. And if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying interview extras, knife giveaways, stickers, early access to the show and more, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Hey, Mike. Good to see you, sir. How you doing, Bob? I'm doing well, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, I appreciate it. I always enjoy it. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned right up there uh, in the intro, uh, you are the owner. You're you're the guy behind CollectorKnives.net. And uh, if people are unfamiliar with you, maybe they're new to the knife game or or uh, haven't seen your site yet, tell us a little bit about uh, CollectorKnives.net. Well, we started just. Uh, I had a buddy that. Uh, was in tight with a lot of the the knife guys back east the traditional guys parker uh, buster those guys and uh and he had been around doing it a long time he was a machinist in a in a town nearby and uh just got associated with him i was always into knives and so uh, i don't know how i lived 20 miles from this guy I never knew he existed but uh got hooked up with him and started dealing with a lot of the a lot of the bigger names and uh, and traditionals and actually started out with uh, he had bought he, he bought he, had, he had worked as a machinist and and ended up with uh, quite a bit of money in his pocket through options and stuff just a one of them deals where a redneck makes it makes it big and so he uh, he bought he bought an inventory to a bunch of knives sold them locally didn't have any had no didn't even have a smartphone, didn't have a computer, didn't have any of that. So uh, I got in with him and started going over there and, and collecting, buying, you know, everything I could talk him out of. And uh, over time, I just started asking if he wanted to move some of them. And he said, sure. And so we started, I started a consignment deal with him. And uh, it really wasn't, it, it wasn't collector knives for a few years, but uh, ended up being collector knives and we started that in 2004, and uh, that's just how we got hooked. I said I would make a. What we do is I just create a spreadsheet, and he'd send a knife, and he'd say this knife cost me 30 bucks, and if I sold it for 40, I gave him 35 and kept five, so we just split the profit on them, and uh, we did that for a lot of years. And as I made money doing that, I just uh, stuck it back and kept and started buying my own knives from him, and so then I'd have his knives and my knives and we just i just built up never took a dime out of the business just kept it rolling and uh, just built up the business starting from consignment well what were you doing at the same time uh, you said you never took a dime out of the business obviously you were you were doing something else at the same time what was that and what was it like starting in this new business while you were doing that other job <laughs> That, it's complicated, and a lot of people don't believe it. But uh, when I got out of college, I, I, I double majored in math and computer science, so I was a nerd. And I went into the systems, computer systems business, and 
right out of college, went to work for Phillips Petroleum. They had geophysicists that used a Cray supercomputer. So I started administering the Cray supercomputer, keeping it up for them. Cray ended up hiring me to go to Dallas and work to, on a government contractor staging site. And at that, uh, at that job, I was actually the analyst in charge for the largest, at the time, the largest supercomputer system in the world. So it was actually four Cray supercomputers connected together with solid state storage, which back then didn't exist on PCs and most people didn't have access to it, but we had solid state storage that was uh, as big as a refrigerator for you know just a few gigabytes. And, uh, but anyway, that's, um, my dad got, uh, he got renal cell cancer in 2002 and we just, we just had a, uh, we had a two year old, my, two, my boy was just two years old and uh, I had changed jobs a couple of times after that, and, but I was still in the, in the technology. I was director of operations of an internet security company. And I had had about all of Dallas I wanted and I had a kid that I didn't want to grow up in Dallas. And so when dad got sick, he was still a rancher. So we moved back to help where we could with him. And, uh, so at the time I actually got hardcore. I mean, I, like I said, I'd always been in it, but at the time I got hardcore, I was just sitting here doing nothing. I mean, just, just helping him when I could and, and gardening and just doing miscellaneous stuff and kind of went looking for a hobby that I could, you know, spend some time in. And so, yeah, it's my career. Is, I changed jobs every couple of three years and, and God was good. I mean, he took care of me. And, and uh, so I semi retired at 35 and I've been, I've been here now for, you know, since then I'm, I'm 53 now. So. Wow, man. Retired at, at 35. That's uh that's American dream material right there. That's pretty awesome. Well, it, yeah, it, it, it depends on what you're willing to live on, I guess. I mean, you, a lot of people, you can retire with $15,000 in the bank if you want to, I, you know, but uh, <laughs> right. I didn't, by, the, by today's standards, I didn't have near enough money to retire, but uh, I did. And we just couldn't, couldn't make ourselves go back to a city and there's no supercomputer jobs in uh, Podunk, Oklahoma. Right, right. So, uh, wow, supercomputers. Um you know, that seems to be a probably a pretty limited uh, business in terms of how many people there are out there who can work a supercomputer. Do they, do they exist now? Is that even a thing or are, are we carrying them around in our pockets now? They, they do still exist. Actually, when I, I left Cray Research and, uh, and the contractor site, and uh, went to work for Fidelity Investments. And, and and on their side, they didn't have a supercomputer yet. They just had large, large scale systems. So I managed those, but before before I left there, we they had bought a supercomputer. But Cray had went, Silicon Graphics had bought Cray and they kind of disappeared for 10 or 15 years. And I, I just by chance noticed a few weeks ago, they, they come back at some point in time and they're, they're now back a big company and, and uh, doing government contracts and work on supercomputers again. But the, to answer your question, what was a supercomputer then and would take a, a you know, probably 2000 square foot to, to have a, a system the size we had, you could probably fit on the top of a desk these days. I mean, it's Amazing. just that technology has just come so fast. It's uh, it's, but Again, now they've got stuff, you know, that's way faster than any of that. So they can, you know, it's, it's still, they're still, they call it, when I first started at Phil's Petroleum, they call it the world's most expensive chair because it was a big rounded <laughs> system and they had a bench around the outside of it that you could actually sit down on. So it was, uh, they wouldn't hardly let you in the room with it, but it, yeah, they call it the world's most expensive chair. So how does, how does, uh, all of these years of very specialized um, uh, mathematics and computers. Uh, how does that pay off years down the line? You find yourself um, owner of this awesome traditional knife purveyor online. Uh, what's the through line? 
it it uh, didn't it didn't uh, follow into this <laughs> into this field at all. I mean, I can't I I can't even the the programming part I would I never did do. So like building a website and that that stuff I I can do it because I understand systems. But as far as mm-hmm. functionality, getting core components to work, I I hire. I mean, I have a guy that uh, that. I pay to do my bunch of my development work, the early reserve system and things like that. Or, you know, I have, I just hire a guy to take care of it and I spec it out and he, he writes the code to it. I mean, super, super good guy, but, uh, but yeah, it, it didn't. And it's sad because I, I got my boy now, he's a, he's a sophomore in college. And I told him, I said, you know, high schools just to get colleges to accept you and what you learn in college is really just to, to show an employer you have responsibility because I I went like I say four years double majored and got to my first job at Phil's Petroleum and didn't use one bit of what I'd learned in four years so they 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 put me in classes and for training for two months or three months and they taught me everything they wanted me to know so uh but no, after after I left, I understand technology a little better than some, and I know what d- the different components are out there. But as far as being able to use it, zero. Okay. <laughs> uh, the only re- the only way it really the only way it really helped me is I had a good job, so I could afford to you know hoard knives, and so I was I was down there in an apartment in Dallas with a uh, with uh, display cases stacked up in a corner of a of the kitchen. So. All right, so <clears throat> I was fishing, and what I was fishing for was um, fast fast forward to today. You have collectorknives.net, and you design knives. You have them made exclusively for collector knives, and you have companies like Viper and Fox and Lion Steel. I believe you've had Lion Steel make knives for you, uh, mm-hmm. make these exclusives mm-hmm. for you. And I was wondering if if somewhere along the line, computers and design and computer design and all that, but uh, so uh, I, I mentioned up front uh, that you have a knife that just came out that's very exciting, and I want you to talk about it. And I have I have a prototype of it right here. This knife, the recoil, and as you can see, it's a gunstock jack. Gunstock, of course, refers to the shape of the handle, and uh, it's a single bladed clip point. And uh, you sent me this prototype over a year ago. And I've shown it off. I've made close-up videos of it. By the way, check out the close-up video. It turned out really well uh, in terms of close-up shots of this beautiful knife. Um, And uh, it's been the subject of conversation and such on uh, the podcast. And people have been, since I showed this the first time, asking me when they could get it. It's finally out. So tell us a little bit about this knife. Well, I had to go back a little bit. You know, we we first started with the Barlow. I had I had line steel. Uh, I sent them some pictures of a Barlow drawings, and uh, we started that. It was a booming success. I mean, the Barlow's still doing it uh, phenomenal. And after that, uh, I guess Blade Show. I, I was dealing with Viper buying some of their knives, and uh, you know they they said, "Hey, you know, we'd be interested in." Uh, and working on a, a special order if you're if you have any patterns you want to do and uh so we started off on that and and got going with them and then last year early last year well no that's 20 so the viper 19. was the the viper Boy. was the sow belly trapper right or the sow belly uh yeah we actually we, we actually spec to them at the same time. We drew up the sow belly and the sway back. So uh, the sway back come out first and then the sow belly a couple of months later, but we were working on them at the same time. And, uh, and the sway back was doing really well too. And so we were at a show, I, I guess it was, uh, I guess it may have been shot, uh, shot. We first started talking to them and then finished up at blade in 19 and, uh, and but anyway, met uh, Gianni with uh, Line Steel introduced me to Massimo with uh, Fox, and we sit down and talked, and and it was more of, you know, they wanted me to, you know, they were interested in me handling their line, their catalog, and uh, as we got to talking, I'm a, I, I like dealing with the factories. I don't like dealing with wholesalers, and uh, 
and at the time Fox had signed a commitment that uh, Boker USA would import was doing all the importing of their knives and uh, I wasn't interested in, in working with uh, Boker USA and so I but I but he but he said something about but if you if you have anything special let me know and we could do that and so that's that's why I said well hold on a second so we got to talking about that and then when I got back I sat down and drew up, I actually drew up five, four or five patterns and uh, give a line still the first choice at them. And then, uh, and then to, I told Fox, I said, here's some patterns I'm thinking about. Just pick one you want to work on. And uh, that's the one they picked. So, and we, they, they, the, the thing about the, the Maniago guys is every, every factory I've worked with, they are so particular. I mean, they, if you if you give them a little bit, you don't have to worry about them cutting corners or doing something you know that you don't think should be done. I mean, they they come up with a lot of the ideas on their own. They do a lot of the fit work themselves, and uh, so it's I you know I I feel bad taking credit for much of it because if you you draw it out in pencil and and you know scan it in and send it to them and then you they deliver you this phenomenal knife that's just I mean you you couldn't have, you couldn't have thought of setting the blade up and i think i've we've talked about this before but that the blade set up to where it's less resistance coming coming out of full close and uh and then harder snap into yeah. full open uh i don't i don't even know if they meant to do that but i told them i said hey you've got to make sure this makes it into all the the entire production run and so uh, I made the mistake of sending them a sample. They, they said, well, pick the best one you've got and send it back so we can see what you're talking about. And uh, I sent it, I sent it back to them and it was, it took three months, I think for them to get. So they were nearly finished with production by the time they got the knife back, but they hadn't, they hadn't done the blade finishing work yet. So, and I was, I actually was hoping, hoping they'd be able to do something, but I knew it was with a lot of times the knife makers, it's, you know, you'll have, you'll have such a variance that you can't even say anything about an action like that because they may or may not have it. I mean, it just, uh, nice. and, but, but, you know, I kind of run my mouth, uh, on your show and on, in other places, I run my mouth about it. And then when they showed up, everyone I've handled has been, that's a, that's the action they've had. So they did a phenomenal job at getting it, getting it tuned in. So just so people know, uh, uh, just an illustration when you open this knife from here from close to the half stop is real easy and then from the half stop to open it's quite stout and and then same thing in reverse from here to here it's pretty you know it's, it's pretty stout action and then from the half stop close it's nice and easy so it doesn't feel like it's going to chop your finger off and then when you when you pull it out uh, that first bit uh, is is always the tricky part. It's like it's like landing and taking off in an airplane. That's the tricky part, right? Same thing. It's right when you're pulling it open, it could snap shut. So to have that easy action right there is perfect. And then to have the stout action on the open just lets you know that it's going to stay open when you're using it. So I th I thought that was a brilliant stroke there. Yeah, and if you do it, if you if you go from full open to half stop and let the blade let the blade come into half stop. If you'll notice it over travels just a little bit and then comes back into, into full half stop. And that I, I have tried to get people to do that, get that action perfect. And it's because queen, you queen used to could do it on a large Congress. I mean, that was yeah. one of the only patterns, maybe a couple others, but queen <laughs> queen did a phenomenal job at it. And, uh, but I've, I've asked Bill Howard since then, you know, I've showed him and I said, man, that's great. Can you do that? And, Maybe it does, and maybe it doesn't. I don't even know if he tries a lot. Of, most of the time, I think Bill just uh, acts like he's listening. So uh, <laughs> he's, he's got his own he's got his own thoughts about things. But but anyway, they did a really good job of, of that action into half stop too. It's just a, I, I don't even know if that's desired by other people, but I really like it. So it's it's uh, it reminds me a little bit of Wiley e. Coyote coming to a stop. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in the cartoons. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this, this knife has a couple of other, um, uh, Italian hallmarks, uh, and of course they don't have to be Italian, but the, the Italians uh, seem to do this a lot. That's the crowned spine and also the crowned back spring. 
that goes all the way around the you know periphery of the handle. Uh, it's such a nice detail to me. That's a a luxury detail. There are some other. Uh, this micarta is typical Fox luscious Fox micarta. It's really really awesome. The, the materials on this are are outstanding. How is this? Which you look at it, it looks except for the fact that you can see the pivot screw. It looks like a uh, you know, a, a, um, a gunstock jack pulled out of history. But when you look at the materials and you look closely, it's obviously not. T tell us a little bit about the materials in the in the recoil. Well, the recoil we had done uh, with the the uh, Viper, the sway back in the sow belly, we did the integral where it's like take a piece of titanium and just cut cut a bolsters into it but use all one piece on each side. And so uh, Fox wanted to do the same thing. And I said, I said, go for it if it works better for you. And so a lot of the stuff that we do is so that it simplifies the process. I mean, the radius that, that helps them because these knives, I mean, any more these days to make a quantity of knives, they make all the components and then they, they put them together right before they go out. Well, you can't, you can't have to, the back spring into the liner into the slabs and get it all perfectly done, you know, in the amount of time that they zip everything together. So, so they just, and they've got CNC over there. So they just, they just, every, they can get everything cut to where it perfectly is going to fit together. And then just, they, they assemble it. And so, but anyway, the, so the thing about the recoil is it's another knife that has integral uh, liner bolsters and then M390 blade and uh, the belly. We worked for a while on the belly of the of the clip to get it right. And uh, but other than that, and you know, I, a lot of people, a lot of people say something about the torques and the pivots. But if you go back in the history of knives, I mean, they had, they had pins with screws, screw heads on them 80 years ago. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hear I do hear a lot of that, but. It's just, you know, a knife is how you, how you make it today. And, uh, that may offend a lot of people, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that get a, get a great Eastern and would like to tighten the pivot up a little bit and they can't, you know, yeah. they, they either have to take it out and paint it with a hammer and then loosen it back up and paint it again and loosen it back up until they get it just like they want it. Or, you know, you, with that Torx, you can just set it, set it where you want it and put some Loctite on it and you're done. And uh, then you've got the action exactly. And some people, I mean, some people like them looser, some people like them tighter. Yeah. And so, and, and that's, that's the way they're going to do it anyway. I mean, it didn't, it's not like I, I had them do that for that function. That's the way they're going to build the knife and that's the smart way to build the knife. So, yeah. uh, but that's the way it works out, but it's still, you know, you have to be looking pretty hard for something to complain about if, if the Torx heads or what, what, you know, get you bogged down on the knife, but it's not for everybody. Some people want one that looks exactly like a traditional looked right. 60 or 70 years ago. And I, that's, that's, that's where we ended up somewhere in between. So. Well, that, that's what I was going to say. If you're even considering the recoil, um, designed by Mike Latham, produced by Fox Knives, and exclusively offered at uh, collectorknives.net. If you're considering the knife, obviously you know you're getting a, a traditional style, uh, modern slip joint knife. That's the whole point. Uh, and, and like you said, if you want something built in the traditional style, here's a, here's a number 44 uh, GEC, beautiful knife, also a gunstock jack. Uh, you could get something like this, but this knife is produced in uh, the modern fashion. Like, like you were saying, uh, parts uh, all made, you know, universally all grouped and then assembled last minute and sent out. That's how, that's how a, a um, you know, most modern knives are made. Uh, most knives are not made like this anymore. And uh I don't know. There's something. Uh, there's something about this that just seems like a step forward. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's it, it just makes it easier to work with. I mean, if you get if you get some trash under it, you can take those slabs off, clean them up. And we we haven't made one that's fully that you can fully disassemble and just 
you know, your back spring pins, it, screws don't really work very well for back spring, string pins, mm -hmm. back spring pins. So if you can't, if you go all the way through that back spring to either side, uh, you know, you got to do something a little different. So, so we've just hadn't worried about it. I mean, and to be honest with you, if you make a knife that, that you can tear completely down, you're going to have a lot more returns from people saying they got a knife that had this screw, this screw stripped or that screw strip stripped. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, as a, for good customer service, you just have to take care of them, but you know, it didn't leave with a, with a screw yeah. strip. So yeah. the, the more you can take a knife, the more you can take a traditional knife down the, the, the more, you know, you're going to, you're going to have things you have to replace and components that have to be replaced on. And, and so that's, you know, we, we, the, and, and like I say, it just goes back to the tuning, the tuning and the cleaning. And if I, if I run out of, if I run out of Micarta handled recoils and I, I still have a couple of, you know, of another handle, I can, I can, I can move stuff back from, if I set stuff back, I like, like a lot of times I look at knives and if I got one that's got a problem with a blade or whatever, I, I set it back. And, uh, and then later I, if somebody has got a warranty or whatever, I can, I can take that knife apart and use the components for, for another knife to get them, you know, get them fixed up. If, you know, if they ruined a handle or if they stripped a screw or something like that. And that's a real luxury in your line of uh, of what you sell anyway. You know, when you sell a lot of traditional style knives, if you if you buy a whole bunch of Gabon ebony thinking that everyone's going to want this because everyone wanted it last time and then you get it and you're sitting on. I mean, with GEC, I guess you probably don't sit on GECs for very long at all anymore. But um, in terms of just like having having a handle that is unpopular or a or a blade set that's unpopular um, with a traditional style, you, you can't do anything with it. You're right. You just got to wait around for it to sell. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned before. Yeah. And if you have, if you have one, knife, if you have, if you have one knife, that's got a, you know, got a scratch on the blade and you got another knife that's got a, you know, a, a crack pin crack on the handle, then you've just got two knives that you have to deeply discount where in this case I can, you know, I can just move some components around and have a have a perfect knife, and then have a knife that needs to be discounted. So, or put in my pocket and used. So, it 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 has its it has its positives. I mean, I I'm I'm still a a traditional guy, so I, I would still if everything else could be equal, I would prefer having you know a pinned a pinned pinned knife, uh, traditional like Great Eastern makes them. But you know, that's what you, my market the market for the knives I was carrying at the time just started going away. I mean, I brand and Boker and Hinkles and kissing cranes and hen and roosters and all that stuff, you know, they just don't exist anymore the way they did 15, 20 years ago. And uh, queen, I mean, just people were going Camillus. They were all going out of business and just giving up. So I had to, you know, great Eastern, worked great for the first few years. I mean, he would kind of, you know, he'd build, there was a time where Bill would call me up and say, Hey, you want anything made? But you know, the last several years it's, and now it's down to nothing. You know, you can't, they don't even do contract knives anymore. So, uh, I either had to just decide to go solely great Eastern, what they wanted to send me or start branching out. And, uh, and when I, when I got the product, I mean, I, I, I become introduced to line steel just by ordering, I ordered, you know, 30 or 40 knives out of their catalog directly from them and then got them in, looked at them and, you know, made a decision I was going to carry their full catalog. And so I had been with them just carrying their catalog for, I don't know, maybe up to a year before I started uh, you know, talking to them about contract knives and just doing special, special products. You mentioned uh, you were talking about a number of the older uh, traditional knife companies that are here no longer or got absorbed into other companies or or what have you. And you mentioned Queen. And uh, recently I bought a Queen from Smoky Mountain Knife Works. Now, I think uh, this is not the Queen you're talking about. I think that these are, are made. I think they are, are now owned by Smoky Mountain Knife Works. And I think they make them in their maybe in their Rough Rider factory. It's a... Uh, this was a $20 uh, Warncliffe slip joint. Um, 
uh, pretty pretty nice, you know. It but it's got the it's got the 440A steel and and but it's got some decent bone covers and nice fit and finish and walk and talk and stuff like that. Um, what what is the deal with Queen? Uh, what what were they when you were collecting them, and what are they now? Well, when I first started dealing with them, it was with my my partner, and we were, you know, he was. He really just did case knives and bulldog knives, and he had, he knew Jim Parker, and he had actually, uh, I may have told this before, but he, Jim Parker back in 94, 95, the story was that he was getting heat over his fighting bulldog tank stamp, and so he was going to a different tank stamp, and, uh, and he contacted my buddy and said, hey, I've got, you know, whatever, 5,000 knives or something. Do you want to, you want to buy the whole line of the fighting dogs out so I can get started on the, the standing dogs? And, uh, my buddy said, sure. You know, so they negotiated out a deal. And so he started, I mean, we were doing a bunch of bulldogs at the time, but, uh, we started trying to expand as we started doing consignment and he was moving more. We, we were looking for other brands. And like I say, he had, he had a buddy and his name was Oscar back east and he was a big dealer for uh, case and hen and rooster and uh, uh boker and so you know we we did some with him picked up some of the other brands and then i contacted uh queen and just talked with them for a little while and then set up a dealership with them and we started buying uh, a bunch of items from Queen at the time, you know, Case was still making probably the best knife, best traditional knife being made through the nineties. I mean, they had several that were making, you know, theirs and then, but Queen, we knew Queen was making the Case Classics and those Case Classics were, they were a better knife than the Case, Case branded stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and so I got a hold of Queen and that's, that's, we started carrying their basic line at the time, but it was, those were D2 and they were the amber carved stag bone, the, the original amber carved stag bones. And those knives were just, I mean, they were outstanding knives and some patterns were better than others, but you could get into them in the thirties, you know, and you could sell them in the forties and, you know, it, around where I'm at, everybody loved more maker knives and more maker is a, is a branching tool brand. I mean, they started out with pliers and, fence fencing material and stuff but they started making having queen make their run of knives they were all branded more maker but more maker was just a quonset hut out in the field in matador texas so they didn't they didn't make hardly anything out there but they got to over the years they i mean last time i talked to them when when queen was kind of in trouble they said they had six hundred thousand dollars worth of knives back ordered with queen so they were a monster buyer of contracted queen knives and and i could go i went to my dad had the feed store and you'd go down there and i had the bulldog from queen queen made a few bulldogs i made a couple of patterns i had the queen bulldog sow belly and and he had just got in some more makers and he had a more maker sow belly and i set them down beside each other and i said you know that they're made at the exact same place and he you know he looked at it and he said yeah but he said the cowboys won't buy a a bulldog knife and that's we ought to try them and sure enough he said he tried with several of them and he had a he had a forty dollar bulldog knife and a ninety dollar more maker knife and you couldn't get a cowboy to pick up the bulldog knife so really? so that's when we, yeah it was it was crazy and the and and the more maker was 1095 and the the bulldog was uh you know it was i guess it was 1095 but my, most of their patterns were d2 which in my mind was way better than 1095 for what you were doing because you're out sweating you know and yeah. uh you're just dirty and filthy and 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 so it worked out a lot better but so anyway we, we i learned you know i knew queen could make a phenomenal knife so we just got started with them and uh and and the queen baseline all you could buy from queen was the queen line 
if you wanted the Shat and Morgan line, you had to go to Clarence Reisner because he had the contract for the what they call the Keystone series, every knife that had the Keystone shield on it, which was the Shat and Morgan and the top end, the ATS stuff. And so, you know, then we started doing doing work with Clarence Reisner, which my buddy Art already knew him and already dealt with him. So we were getting it from a couple of different directions. But uh but yeah, in the late nineties, early two thousands, there was there was no better knife than than a, a queen made knife as far as I'm concerned. Well, what happened to him? Well they uh I don't know, but I it it started when uh Bill hired left from what I could tell. Uh it just the quality started going downhill. You couldn't get anybody to answer the phone. Uh, mm. And it just got worse and worse. I mean, it by, yeah, I get heat probably left in, I guess, late, late 2006. And by 2008, there were, I was sending back bunches, bunches mm. of knives. And then it, it didn't get a lot better uh, for a few years, but it got a lot worse after Ken Daniels left Great Eastern, uh, which who's Bill's original partner and and went to bought Queen and after that they were they were kind of they weren't the, they weren't local they were still in Ohio trying to run a factory that was already having troubles and it just went downhill from there I mean they still made some good knives but they they made a bunch that had trouble that's a big fear I have about Great Eastern Cutlery um you know I I've, I've never spoken with Bill Howard or talked with anyone over there about that or with anyone over there at all but um you know I, I i'm sort of aware of the kind of businesses it is it's a small business it's a family owned and run business as far as i can see and what always kind of freaks me out is as a you know someone who loves their knives and almost sees them in my own mind as an institution what happens if the next generation has no interest. What if they want to be, uh, you know, hedge fund managers and veterinarians and, and other things, but not, you know, knife makers, what happens, you know, where do we get our, you know, those knives from Does someone else spring up in their, in their stead? Yeah. And that's, I mean, these guys like, like great Eastern and, and they may be the, the last ones making a just pure traditional, knife and you know they don't make enough money for it to be i mean i don't i don't i don't think they're planning on generations you know of that family staying in the knife business i mean there's just not they make money you know and they make their their margins are probably i'm sure a little higher now than they were 15 years ago but it's not a windfall profit business the way they're in it so uh they could just, I mean, you know, if Bill wants to retire and, and, and his boy doesn't want to pick it up, they might just shut the, shut the doors. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but that's, you know, the problem with knives are they're only, they're only a great knife while they're making them because some of the best brands that I've handled, you know, they, they quit making them themselves and then they sold the rights to the name and now they're making them you know, in, a, in, in another place and people don't want to have to guess. I mean, if I, I still have, I still have a vault full of hen and roosters and bokers and bulldogs and, but they're, they're all being made, you know, in China now and they're, you know, vast majority of them and they don't say that on them, but that's, that's where they're being made. And so people know they're being, there's some made in China and some made in Germany and so, you know, and that, that's fine, but, but what a lot of people do is they buy the $15, $20 knife and then say it's a hundred dollar knife and, you know, put the screws to people. So the, the response from most of the collectors out there is I don't want to have to try and figure out what is right and what's not right. And so I'm just not buying that brand anymore. So there's, I've had, I've had a ton of people just walk away from, you know, the, the, some of the best made knives from 40, 50 years ago, they just walk away from them, won't touch them because they don't know who's making them. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's that's an issue. And and in a way, um, and I don't know, maybe this is just my own impression, but certain kind of things like these kind of traditional knives. Um, I don't know. I, I like the fact that yours are made in Italy and that these others are made in America. These are old, old, uh, um, you know, knife making traditions and. I don't know. It it makes me a little bit sad to to think of of institutions like that going away. And maybe they're not institutions. That's just how I see them. But uh, you know, Great Eastern Cutlery they they basically make a historical representation of the past. You basically make a modern day interpretation of of an ageless design. Um, you know, and and you come out at the end uh, with the same thing: a tool that can cut. Uh, but they, but they both, they bring you different feelings and that's kind of, that's kind of, uh, what, what knife makers are not, I mean, what knife fanatics and collectors are concerned with. Um, so why, why traditional knives for you? Why it, what is it about traditional knives that, that, uh, have you, um, that have you captured when there's a whole world of all these cool modern things happening and mechanisms and such? Well, I, it would be great if I had a real reason for that. But to be honest with you, I mean, I've deal in Medford's and, you know, liner locks, frame locks. I've, I've kind of branched out. Cause like I say, if you stay in, if you're just going to sell traditional, you're going to be in trouble. You know, you're going to have a pretty small market. So we've branched out, you know, and I've tried, I've tried a lot of stuff. There was a time where I just, I said, I'm going to do best of breed. I'm not going to try and have every fixed blade or I'm not going to try and have every, you know, every top end frame lock. And so there was a time where I, I did Olamix and, uh, you know, and that, that was back when they were still kind of struggling to get enough product out to, to make everybody happy. And so, you know, I, I kind of eased out of that, but, uh, I, you know, I, I do them all, but it's still where I started. I don't have, there's no good reason for it. No, no, uh, you know, no epiphany just that I started with, with an old trapper and an old stockman. And that's just that to me, that's, that's traditional. I mean, that's just where I, where I come from. So you, you can't really account for what captures you, you know, like you can't, you can't really account for the things that, uh, um, well, that capture you like knives. I, 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 I still, you know, it's the materials, it's the, there are a lot of things that go into it, but, but, uh, uh, in, in any case, here's here's another modern, traditionally styled knife, um, and this is a cheetah, or this is a um, well, a swing guard knife, and uh, this is a a prototype of your design. Uh, a Lion Steel created it, and uh, this is another, this is another case. Like like, what I like about this is its mo modernity. What I like about most traditional style knives is the oldness the materials and that and that kind of thing um so talk a little bit about about this swing guard knife is this uh still in the works or was this a flight of fancy it's it's still it's out there it's just everything you know with covid just shut down in in maniago and so we were excuse me uh, we were way behind on, on everything. And, uh, and so that one's just the one that got slipped. And so it's, it's still sitting out there, we, but we haven't, they're working on, they're behind with other customers. So they're trying to get caught up once they get caught up with some of the stuff that they had agreed to do two years ago, then we'll, we'll get back to it. It's, I, I, I use Facebook and I use some places to kind of gauge, you know, where people are at or what they're looking for, or if they're interested in something. And, uh, you know, and that's one that they're interested in, but they're not, they're not frothing at the mouth for it. So I'm not, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta do this stuff. You gotta spend 50 or 60,000 bucks on it to get it in the house. And then right, right. it better sell when you get it there. Cause the little old, little old shop like me working out of my garage is not going to do very good with a, you know, with a safe full of, you know, $150 knives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay. So, what to you is uh, the most tr um, useful 
traditional pattern. That can also be your favorite pattern, but but I'm I'm really interested in what you think is the best out there. And there's so many different patterns. I'm going to do a, a podcast one of these days, uh, just or, or a video, just kind of running down the different patterns that I have. And just incidentally, you helped me. Um, you've helped me fill that category out a lot, actually, um, in hooking me up with some, with some knives I was having trouble getting, uh, which were greatly appreciated. But uh, after I was in a Rough Rider phase, you sent me some Rough Riders, uh, which was not only cool, but it, I got some patterns in that little collection of booty that you sent that I didn't have. Muskrat, you know, never had exposure to that. I've always kind of looked at them. And uh, and now I, I love the muskrat. And, and you know, I can say that about a lot of different uh, a lot of different patterns, but there are so many patterns. What to you is the most useful? What's your favorite? Well, I started with the canoe. I mean, when I first started collecting, that's what I that's what I started with. And like I say, I had a had a pretty good paying job, so I got stupid with it. I have still have <laughs> hundreds of canoes and there for a while. I mean I had I had probably every canoe case it made up through the nineties, you know, wow. at one time and so I still have them somewhere, but and then I started, you know, I brand canoes and just everybody's canoes. So that's that's the pattern that that I'm knee deep in that I love. But these days I'm you know I'm kind of if I'm going to grab a knife I grab a usually a sodbuster or that's Casey's name. So yeah. Uh, but a that that pattern of knife just it's, it's easy. It's you know supposed to be cheap. They're not cheap anymore. But uh, but they're a, a basic pattern. And uh, I actually that was one of my one of my projects that just it got to where it uh, to make it the, what I wanted to make. It got outside the range where I felt like people were, were would uh, be interested in buying it. I had a, mm. I actually on the, I actually went ahead and trademarked the name and it was Sudbuster. And because the case is pretty particular about anybody using Sodbuster. Yeah. So I decided I'd just do a Sudbuster and it would be the, essentially a, the, the same pattern but we designed in the back and had a back lock on it. And then at the very butt end had a, a knife that worked on a, uh, on a detent and come out was a bottle opener. I love and uh, we, we got it designed and got it, you know, got it all in CAD and everything. And uh, I put it up on Facebook and said, Hey, what y'all think about this? And, and it was, it was, you know, People weren't, you know, there, of course, there are always people, you know, that, that liked it, but then there are people that didn't like it. And then, then I thought, well, if I told them what this silly thing was going to have to cost, I, you know, <laughs> I'd see I have a mutiny. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. we just, we just paused, paused the whole project. And, uh, and that's one that was sitting out there. So now I've got a trademark for a knife that I can't even show a picture of to the, to the oh, trademark guy. So. I love it though. I love it. I love the concept. Of a of a of a sod buster with a with a uh, a bottle opener on it uh, because it it is it's the working man's knife and when the working man is done working he can crack himself a beer with it but also I like I like knives that incorporate other tools um, you know and I'm not talking like multi tools but I like a, a secondary tool on a knife like that but also I I also love the tip of the hat and the kind of the smart assishness of calling it the sod buster I think that's uh, mm -hmm that's pretty cool well, it's, yeah it was that was we, we had to hit it a couple of times to get it to go through but uh once you get those things through and you get them out there where people have their time to to you know scream if they don't like it and they don't scream then you're pretty much set so like i say you know that's money wasted now unless i go ahead and finish pull pull blow the dust off of it and finish up the pattern but uh Another one we kind of worked on, and it's in it's in holding right now, but it's a lot closer to going. Is that same the swayback with the that I did with Viper? Uh, we've designed, and I actually had help with a guy off Blade Forms. It's a that is a, a sheep foot aficionado, mm -hmm. and we did a sheep foot blade in that same swayback. And it's I mean it looks like a you know if you cover the torques, it looks like a hundred knife hundred year old knife. It really looks outstanding. But again, they're they're way behind and, and, uh, we're way behind me. The markets, the market's awful. Now my market's awful and it's slow, slow. So, uh, 
can't really afford to finish that one either. What is your favorite knife period? I know you have a huge collection of case, uh, uh, case canoes, as you mentioned before. Uh, but what if, if you could, you know, if you could only have one and, uh, and walk around with it all the time. And that was your knife. Uh, this is not a survival situation we're talking about, so it doesn't have to be a machete or anything like that. Um, just like your favorite pocket knife. Well, the favorite one I like to have and show people and carry around is a is a Dom, uh, a line steel Dom. I sent off to Birdvis, and I may have showed you this before. Oh man! But... So so uh, that's uh, uh, Timson. Nick Timson did the handle skills for that. Yeah, yeah. I was at Blade and picked up some some Mastodon and. Uh, <sighs> And there was a time where he, he did a lot of work like that. Instead of just straight custom work, he did a lot of, you know, tweaking on existing knives and making handles and stuff. And so at that time, I just said, hey, I'm, and I work out of trade with him. I said, hey, I've got a couple of couple of these doms that have, uh, you know, bad handles. Uh, and uh, can I trade you a couple of frames for doing some work for me? And he said, sure, send them on. So he's done a couple for me. And uh, like I say, that was back back in the day and uh but that but i mean when i go outside i've got a i've got a mazarin they call it a sport pattern it's a little liner lock doesn't look anything like a traditional and it's got d2 steel and when i go outside that's the one i clip on my pocket you know i kind of makes me feel dirty every time i do it but i still do it every time <laughs> i walk outside so. wait, wait 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 why does it make you feel dirty what makes you feel dirty well i'm the I'm a traditional guy, and when you <laughs> when you use a clip to put a knife in your pocket, then you're you're betraying, you know. Oh, Mike, I love that. I love that you're a purist. You're an you're a total purist, man. That's like uh, that was like me with pizza for the longest time. I was such a pain in the ass with pizza. I was like, no, 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 no. You know, I'd be with people. We'd be ordering. Uh, let's put. Let's get the. No, 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 no. You don't put that on pizza. Yeah, but it tastes good. <laughs> uh, so I, I like I, I like and respect your point of view on that, uh, uh, and having Nick Timpson um, make you handle skills for for the Dom. That's that's oh, man, that's really nice. I think his work is just beautiful. Um, before we started rolling, I was I was thinking and looking at knives on your site. And uh, it occurred to me something I could see you doing someday in the future when, when uh, you're coming up with new ideas for knives. I could see falling into your sort of aesthetic, some cool push button automatic. What do you think of that? Hmm. I'm I'm not a fan at all. So <laughs> it's just. Uh, and and I I really don't have a reason why I, I'm just not I'm just not a fan I'm, I guess I'm afraid I'm gonna cut my finger off I don't know it's just uh I I've, I've had some Microtech out the fronts and I've had some you know some standard uh, automatics and Boker Kalishnikovs and stuff and I just I don't know I just never they never grew on me you know I was always I was actually always worried I was gonna there's gonna come up in my pocket and and mm -hmm. you know we were gonna have an issue so. Uh, they've they've come a long way since then, but I just I guess since I never got I never I always had a this perception in my back of my mind that I didn't like them, so I never got never even got to the point of giving them much uh, much chance. But and, and for selling them, I didn't want to have to worry about where they were going. And there was yeah. a time where you know you had to you could get in trouble if you sent them to the wrong state, and and it's you know paying sales tax is more of a fiasco that i want to go through each month so I, I sure don't want to have to try and learn every state's laws oh. on what what knives are legal so dear god yeah uh, really it occurred to me for two different reasons uh one of them is just a practical one uh something that we talked about uh when we discussed your this the swing guard uh last time you and i spoke is that they managed your your design in lion steel's manufactured managed to 
perfect the swing guard it it does not rattle move or there is absolutely zero play it is so tight on there and there's something very very gratifying about that okay so i i feel like with with uh your design sense and their manufacturing capability they could make an awesome modern modern traditional swing guard um you know that's not italian made uh and that would be very or well it is italian made what am i talking about but it's not an old uh old school italian stiletto but a new school italian stiletto so uh, but also i love automatic knives that don't look like automatic knives and i was thinking about your sow belly yeah. single bladed trapper and how cool that would be just to have a shield that you push and it's automatic uh just going off into fantasy land there mike oh that's my my Oh, partner that he was a machinist. So he would, he he took buck one tens and he'd take them out in the shop and he'd put, he'd change a shield on them and, and make them an automatic or he'd take a case lock back and he would take the shield out and make it an automatic through the shield where the spring was activated through the shield and then put, you know, have the shield in it where you would know it was an automatic and it would open up like a standard case knife. So you could open it normally if you didn't know. And if you did know, you push the shield and here the thing comes flying out. So, you know, I've, I've had experience with them. I just, just, but that going back to that, uh, the swing that you have there, we, we originally tried to make the pin that goes through the guard, uh, replaceable with a stud. Oh. And so that you could, so that you could flip it open. And uh, for those that wanted such, you know, sure. and, yeah. uh, we could never get the leverage just right. It was uh, it was just too much work to to get it to fly open from that point. Yeah. And uh, so geometry just didn't work out. So we scrapped the idea. But but anyway, yeah. And that's a, uh, you know, I, I love the old cheetah knives. I never could figure out what the guard was for. Still don't really know. You know I mean, you, you can if you're skinning, it'll save you, I guess, in some situations. But it's just it's really more of a, you know, something an, something of interest than it was functional. But I never did like the fact that they stuck up so high on the on the cheetahs and the jaguars from Case, and so, mm -hmm. you know, we made that one to where it kind of set set and went flush. But uh, you know, and that's a I I really like that knife. I mean, if I was going to go, uh, you know, hunting or you know, I th really thought I was going to need something for some cut, you know, some skinning or some you know cleaning, that's probably the knife I'd grab. I I, I don't like putting, you know, uh, fixed blades on my on my belt and mm -hmm. uh so i could use i could that that size knife's about as big a knife as i need you know and so if i wanted a big <clears throat> knife that's the one I'd, I'd grab and go out with it seems to have a i don't <clears throat> i'm not a, a hunter myself but it seems to have a really great uh, shaped blade for skinning with that belly and it's got a nice length and actually you could you could use that guard for holding on to uh, i always thought that the guard on cheetahs and uh and uh, swing guard traditional knives. I always thought that that was kind of a, uh, you know, a nod to the swing guard stilettos from Italy. Um, but look, hey, it's not a switchblade, but it still has some of that character, you know. I, I you know, in theory, I guess if you're going to fight, you know, if you're going to, you know, you would want a guard on it because, you know, I guess you hit bone, you don't want your hand to keep going, you know. Yeah. But uh, we don't. I don't, I don't uh, do a lot of knife fighting these days and I don't really know anybody that does. So it's kind of a, yeah, but, well, but for skinning, you, you could do the same thing. I mean, if you, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I see your knife fights uh, every few weeks on there. So, uh, but you know, it was, it was, it was just a nod to a pattern that, that I, I really like. And there's a lot of, I mean, nobody does it. I mean, nobody, nobody makes that a swing guard style knife anymore. And so I, you know, just when you're brainstorming about something that's traditional, but you don't have to compete with, you know, two or three other people making it, then that was just one that come to mind. And uh, you need to give that away on a drawing or something. Do your next drawing and give that. I? Uh, well, I guess Do your I? choice. You can enter the re recall one. You need to. Do I really? Yeah, keep you're one right. And give the other one away on a drawing. You're right. That, that is uh, that would be the thing to do. You're right about that. Actually, you're right about that. Ugh. Called me out in front of everybody. Yeah, I love it. Sorry, sorry. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> want to put you on the spot. What I no, meant no, no, to no. say was 
I will, I will send you another one. <laughs> no, 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 you will not. You're right. I, I need to, I need to do more of that anyway. Uh, you know, um, not, not just for the patron members, uh, Patreon members, but just in general. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's a good, uh, inspiration for it. It is such a cool and unique thing. And maybe that's why, uh, <clears throat> it didn't even occur to me until this moment. So, uh, Mike, uh, let everyone know the best way for them to, um, get in touch with you, get in touch with your, your, uh, the website. And, and really, I, I, I want to urge people to check out the recoil because I've gotten so much, uh, so many, um, requests for information over the past year and a half for this knife and it's now out. So tell everyone the covers that it comes in and where to get it and how to, how to get it. I don't know why you're going to do that to me. Cause I'm not sure I even know the covers that it comes in, but it comes, I know it comes in the red and black, uh, carbon fiber. It comes in the micarta. It comes in a, uh, it comes in a, what we're call a bison. It's like a, uh, I went blank, but the, the burlap, burlap oh, micarta, yeah. and then a white, a white micarta. That's like a bone, like a bone micarta. And right. you uh, got, you that's, got the that, that's the ones we've got. And you've got the Bacote wood and then, okay. and then, yeah. and, then nope. the, <laughs> and then everyone go to collect your knives and check this out because they have this knife, this gun stock, this recoil with like a fat carbon, uh, a really, really gorgeously marbled uh, carbon fiber. And you don't hear me say gorgeous and carbon fiber in the same sentence usually, uh, unless it's unique and interesting. And yeah, you have, you have one of these with a, with a crazy looking uh, looks like fat carbon on it. It's so cool. So Mike, thank you so much for coming on, on the knife junkie. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we really like it when you come on. We love when you come on Thursday Night Knives, and uh, I'm really happy that you are out there not only selling these, but designing and making these and having them produced with such top flight uh, companies. So thanks for coming on, sir. Well, I appreciate it, and it, it means a lot to, to have people that, I mean, you, in my business, you get to hear a lot of the negative. It's like being a county commissioner or an umpire at a baseball game. You, you don't normally get to hear the positive. You just get to hear the negative. But uh, I do appreciate it, and uh, let me know if I can ever help with anything. All right. Thank you, sir. Take care. Hi. Thank you. Bye. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mike Latham of CollectorKnives.net. Always a pleasure talking with Mike, um, uh, not only about, uh, well, CollectorKnives.net, but about the process of coming up with new old designs and then having them produced. I just, I love his work. I love these things. And uh, yeah, he's right. I should do a, a giveaway of that swing guard knife. Uh, so mm, keep your eyes peeled. That might happen. Uh, so, uh, also keep your eyes peeled for more episodes of the knife junkie podcast on Wednesday. We have the midweek supplemental on Thursday. We have our live stream Thursday night knives at 10 PM Eastern standard time. And then of course, another interview show on Sunday. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.